Thank you, Rayvon. Well, welcome to town. You can come back. <laughs> See? <laughs> it was April of 1962. A friend of mine, Bill Flanagan, had just enrolled at Princeton Theological Seminary and he got a special assignment to be a driver. A driver for the greatest theologian of the 20th century, a man named Karl Barth. Karl Barth was coming to Princeton for the sesquicentennial celebration, which is 150 years of the seminary being around. Karl Barth was coming, making his only trip to America in his career. And my friend Bill Flanagan, as a young student, was assigned to be his driver. Karl Barth gave lectures, preached. Everybody made a big deal over Karl Barth, who had written books that would fit on a shelf at least this wide, with little print. There was a news conference that was held. A lot of the press was around and was very interested in the event. James Reston was a reporter for the New York Times, and he stood up to ask a question of Professor Bart at the press conference. He said, Professor Bart, there are many of us here who really have not read any of your massive theological volumes, would it be possible for you to just briefly tell us what it is that you say in them? And according to my friend Bill, this is what happened. Bart paused for a little bit, put his hand up to his chin, smiled, and said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Ah, yes. How exactly right. How exactly right. Bart was speaking words which had been written more than a century earlier. You have in your bulletin this handout, and you're going to need this handout. And if you don't have this handout, see a hand, and Mary Lou, can you help on that one? <laughs> In 1860, a novel was written in America called Say and Seal. Say and Seal. It was written by these two sisters, Susan Bogart Warner and Anna Bartlett Warner. They lived on Constitution Island in New York area, and they were writers. Susan, a few years earlier, had written a book called The Wide, Wide World, which was the first novel to sell a million copies in America. Forgotten today, but very influential then. But really, they were as well known as they were struggling. And they were up each morning at 4.30 a.m., to write. They had grown up in privilege. Their father had been a lawyer in New York City. But in a financial panic of 1837, he lost virtually his entire fortune. They moved to Constitution Island across the Hudson River and lived in the servants' quarters of what was going to be a mansion for them. Their mother had died 
very early on, Anna never knew her mother. And it was a constant struggle. The girls learned that they could write, and it was through writing that they were barely able to eke out a living, even with bestsellers like Susan's Wide, Wide World. In 1859 and 1860, they set about writing together a novel called Say and Seal in two volumes. This is a hard-to-find copy of volume one from 1860. It was the story of John Endicott Linden, a young man who came to a Connecticut town to be the teacher in the public school there. He also became the Sunday school teacher, and while there, he met the beautiful, young, unmarried Faith Derrick. They worked together in the Sunday school. And Say and Seal is their story. Their story and the story of a little boy named Johnny Fax. F-A-X. Johnny Fax. Johnny was about nine years old. He was a student in Mr. Linden's class. He was different than all of the others in the class. Smaller, sickly. His mother had died. His father was pretty much close to worthless. And Mr. Linden, the teacher, more or less adopted Johnny Fax. And regularly in the school, while Mr. Linden was teaching the lessons, he would allow little Johnny Fax to sit in his lap, which was the place where this little boy felt safe. There came a terrible day in February where Johnny Fax got sick. The doctors did not know what they could do. The father couldn't be found even to take care of the boy, but Mr. Linden and Faith took care of him as his health deteriorated. There came one night when the boy really could barely speak. All he could do was to stretch up his arms to Mr. Linden and say, walk. And Mr. Linden would pick him up and just walk him around the room. And it was where Johnny Fax could find the only peace that he could find during that time. While Mr. Linden was walking him around the room with Faith Derrick there watching them, another word came from the boy. Sing. And Mr. Linden, who had been his Sunday school teacher, began to sing to him a song these words as he walked Johnny Fax around the room. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Jesus loves me, he who died, heaven's gate to open wide, he will wash away my sin. Let his little child come in. Jesus loves me, loves me still, though I'm very weak and ill. From his shining throne on high comes to watch me where I lie. Jesus loves me. He will stay close beside me all the way. 
then his little child will take up to heaven for his dear sake. The story was by Susan Warner, but the words to that hymn that Mr. Linden sang to little Johnny Fax were by Susan's sister Anna. In the story, it would not be long before little Johnny Fax died, but died in the assurance that Jesus loved him and was going to take him home. The song, though, didn't die. The novel was a great success. It spread throughout the country, and the song began to be sung in Sunday schools. But one problem there. There were words, but no music. And so in the different places where the Sunday schools would sing that song, they would have to find some tune that would fit the words. Until 1862, when the song was sent to the most famous hymn writer in the country, a man named William Batchelder Bradford, Bradbury, who had written hymns like Just As I Am, The Solid Rock on Christ the Solid Rock, He Leadeth Me and Others. It was Bradbury who set the, the song to the tune that we know, who added the chorus, Jesus loves me, this I know. And then, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Where did Anna Warner get the words? when she wrote about the little ones who belong to him? From our scripture of the morning, on the other side of the insert. Matthew chapter 18. See if you can recognize anything here. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. Little ones to him belong. Jesus tells us to be like little ones. Now, I teach preaching at Fuller Theological Seminary, and I hear a lot of sermons, a whole lot more sermons than you've ever had to listen to. <laughs> now, I need to tell you that when 
a student announces this as his or her text. I grimace and tense up. Because it usually is going to end up in a sermon like this. Jesus teaches us to be like little children. We need to learn to play like little children. We need to learn to be creative like little children. We need to trust implicitly like little children. We need to put beans in our ears like little children. But that's not what Jesus is talking about when he says you need to be like little children. The, there's a new translation of the New International Version, which I've used on here, and they get it exactly right when they say, therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom. What's Jesus talking about when he brings a child there? The disciples are arguing about who is the greatest. Who's the most important? Who's the most significant? Me? And Jesus brings a little child and says, unless you become as insignificant as this little child, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. What is it about a child that Jesus was pointing to and telling us that we needed to be like? You need to be as unimportant as this child because on the social totem pole, children were not considered cute, sweet, or particularly valuable. Back then, the children were at the very bottom of the social, social totem pole and the most insignificant and unimportant of all people. A contrast to those who wanted to be great. That's what the little ones are like that Jesus says belong to him. Are you ready to give up your goal of greatness? Are you ready to be insignificant in the eyes of the world? Will it be enough for you that even if people don't notice you, that Jesus sees you and says, you are mine? That's what it means to be one of the little ones. Unnoticed by the world, but embraced by Jesus. Jesus teaches us to be like little ones. And Jesus asks us to seek out the little ones. Jesus wants us to welcome his little ones. To be searching like a shepherd looking for a lost sheep. To be looking for those who are not important as the world counts important to be looking for those little ones who are even annoying and welcoming them, embracing them. And Jesus says that as you reach out to those, those little ones, you're welcoming me. Not the big important ones, but the little ones. Unnoticed. Annoying. Unimportant. These are the little ones that Anna wrote about. Little ones to him belong. And they are the ones that Jesus promises to strengthen. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Paul, Paul reminds the Corinthians, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. 
But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things, the things that are not, to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. Jesus claims the little ones. Lord, help us to be little enough to fit into your lap. Forgive our need to be important, our desires to be great and noticed. Lord, let it be enough for us that we are your little ones and that there is a place for us in the lap of the one who loves the little ones. Jesus loves me. This I know. Hi, this is Pastor Zachary Kittner. If you've been inspired um, by anything that you've seen on the site today or encouraged, we would encourage you to uh, give a one-time donation or to become a regular donor every month to the ministry and help us to continue to spread the word of the truth, love, and power of Jesus Christ. Thank you.